So welcome everyone to my talk today. This is going to be a fairly dense and complicated talk for most of you, I guess. It's also a complex paper for me, so apologies that I will be reading my paper rather than uh, speaking freely. I also have to apologize. I'm not a native English speaker, so you may notice some infelicities in expression and in wording, but I hope it's going to be clear enough. And lastly, as Vicky said, there's going to be a handout. There was a handout distributed to you, so you can take a look at that um, while I speak, and that's going to give you some uh, pointers. In my talk today, I want to present and discuss two different approaches to the study of Buddhist philosophy. I will primarily refer to pre-modern Indian or South Asian Buddhist philosophy situated within the larger historical frame from the historical Buddha's lifetime to the demise of Buddhism as an intellectual force on the Indian subcontinent around the 13th or 14th century common era. For Tibetan or East Asian Buddhism, the situation will differ somewhat, so not all of my observations uh, will apply, both for historical reasons and because the modern academic study of these fields evolved in different ways to that of Indian Buddhism. But it should still be possible to extend some of my observations beyond the scope of Indian Buddhism, and I hope you'll find them relevant even if your primary interest is not in this field. To begin with, and by way of an introduction to the subject, I want to make some general and conceptual remarks on the place of philosophy within Buddhism. Buddhism is a set of doctrines, practices, and institutions with a long and complex history of more than 2,500 years, extending across nearly all of Asia. It can certainly not be reduced to a philosophy in the general sense of a particular way of thinking of an approach to the world that is theoretical and analytical. Yet ideas about the nature of the world and the mind occupy a central place in Buddhist doctrine. Such ideas include the doctrines of no self, of impermanence or arising independence, or in Mahayana, the notion of universal emptiness. Throughout the history of Buddhism, such fundamental ideas and principles have been subject to much penetrating analysis performed with sophisticated intellectual tools and methods, and oftentimes in a highly systematic and rigorous fashion. In other words, there is much philosophy within the larger context of Buddhism as a religious and cultural phenomenon. According to a baseline understanding of Buddhist philosophy that you also have on the handout, it encompasses all theoretical traditions that devoted themselves to explaining, justifying, or defending general teachings ascribed to the or a Buddha, which are often subsumed under the rubric of the Four Noble Truths. This then further also extends to principles that in the course of history came to be thought of as being implied by such teachings or as being required in order to make them intelligible. This baseline understanding does not allow for a rigid boundary between philosophical discourse on the one hand and other kinds of discourse that we might be inclined to label as doctrinal, soteriological, or religious. We might, of course, apply external criteria and delineate areas of philosophical thought more sharply, areas that can be identified as having been pursued by Buddhist thinkers, such as metaphysics, ontology, epistemology, and logic, as well as ethics, fields that we know from Western philosophy. Still, for methodological reasons, our concept of philosophy applied to Buddhist thought will always have to be malleable and somewhat fuzzy around the borders. This is because we cannot impose contemporary boundaries between philosophy and other knowledge systems on historical environments whose intellectual landscape was structured differently. The same also applies to the post-enlightenment boundary between philosophy and religion, which can also not be imposed on Asian traditions. We cannot approach Buddhist thought with a highly technical understanding of philosophy that might, for instance, emerge from the perspective of contemporary analytic philosophy. The principle of working with malleable notions when dealing with past knowledge systems is by the way, by no means limited to our dealing with Asian traditions 
The German historian of medieval European philosophy, Kurt Flasch, for instance, argues the same point, though in somewhat different terms. For Buddhist philosophy, it remains important to consider that it takes place within an overarching framework where intellectual pursuits are shaped by the ultimate soteriological and practical ideal of attaining liberation. A further important point to consider is that Buddhist philosophical traditions developed over time in diverse cultural contexts and social settings of ancient India, traditional Tibet, or modern Japan, to name but a few, and in particular, that they developed in diverse intellectual cultures. There is considerable historical and cultural variation regarding modes of philosophical expression, but also regarding intellectual practices and methods, as well as the very questions that Buddhist philosophers came to address. The different environments in which Buddhist philosophers operated across Asia likewise led to regionally and historically specific philosophies. In pre-modern India, Buddhist philosophy was profoundly shaped by the coexistence of multiple religious groups and philosophical traditions that were to some extent associated with these groups. Brahmanical schools that operated within the fold of Vedic orthodoxies, China, as well as materialists. In this environment, we find over time different kinds of interaction between these groups, ranging from the mutual borrowing of ideas, often unacknowledged, to outright polemical confrontation in debate on a backdrop where the survival of philosophical and religious traditions uh, was dependent on royal patronage. All of this shaped how problems were viewed and what kinds of solutions were proposed and how they could be justified. And this situation is of course different when we turn to Tibet, China, Korea, or Japan. Buddhist philosophical traditions are essential to the history of Buddhist thought, and they merit being studied first and foremost in their own right. But there are also benefits from their study for the knowledge of Buddhism at large, and I will just single out two of these. First, studying Buddhist philosophy affords us with insights into what we may call the self-reflection of Buddhism as a religion as we come to appreciate how thinkers methodically reflected on the soteriological principles taught by the or a Buddha and sought to develop a coherent and rational understanding of them. Secondly, philosophical traditions form part of intricate cultures of scholarship. Philosophers are often monastic scholars or associated with other types of institutions and communities devoted to study and teaching. The study of philosophical traditions also offers insights into how Buddhist scholarship evolved and changed over time, how it developed methods of analysis and deployed specific intellectual practices, in particular in the areas of hermeneutics, logic, and dialectics. Dialectics here meaning rules and principles of scholarly debate. There is a growing body of literature striving to demonstrate that Buddhist philosophy also bears relevance to philosophical discourse today. In recent times, the focus has here has been particularly on the philosophy of mind. Philosophical theories of consciousness have been the subject of several significant studies, some of which you can find listed on the handout scattered throughout the different sections. But arguments for the contemporary relevance of Buddhist ideas have also been advanced for theories of personal identity linked to the teaching of no self, for theories of concept formation, of language, as well as reasoning. Such arguments are nowadays linked with broader initiatives aiming to make the academic discipline of philosophy more inclusive and to make philosophy curricula at universities more credibly global. Such initiatives have met with some success in the most recent times. Several positions in subfields of Asian philosophy that are also relevant for Buddhist studies have been established in philosophy departments in Northern America, as well as Europe. I'm not as knowledgeable about other parts of the world, so I'll limit myself to that. For Indian philosophy, for instance, at the universities of British Columbia and Toronto in Canada, for Buddhist philosophy at the University of New Mexico in the United States, 
and for Asian philosophy in general at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands, a position that was filled by Stephen Harris, who works on Buddhism. A further sign that academic interest in Asian philosophical traditions in general has increased and broadened is the steadily growing number of English language handbooks published by large academic publishing houses. Here too, you see some recent examples relating to Indian and Buddhist philosophy on the handout. And lastly, a quite elaborate argument for why in particular philosophers should be interested in Buddhist philosophy in the first place was developed in Jay Garfield's 2015 monograph, Engaging Buddhism, Why It Matters to Philosophy. So far to give you an initial idea of the conceptual understanding of Buddhist philosophy and some of the relevant factors uh, in our contemporary environments. Now we can distinguish two fields in the contemporary academic world from within which Buddhist philosophy is being approached. The one comprises so-called area studies, disciplines and fields like South Asian, East Asian and Tibetan studies. Buddhist studies is often pursued under their umbrella. The denomination of these disciplines may vary around the globe depending on national or local academic histories. In Northern America, for instance, the association with religious studies is much stronger than, for instance, in continental Europe. As far as philosophy is concerned, scholars who work within this area studies context tend to ask questions primarily about history, the history of philosophical literature, the meaning and development of ideas and concepts. They historically trace theories and arguments, methods and intellectual practices, or the formation of particular schools and movements. The second major field is philosophy which as a discipline also varies considerably around the globe. As is often pointed out, analytic philosophy dominates philosophy departments in the Anglo-American world, whereas continental philosophy occupies a larger share in continental Europe. In any case, if we look at the work that is being published today on Buddhist philosophy, we can see these two distinct approaches that emerge from these two broadly different disciplinary backgrounds. And I think it's important to relate them to these disciplinary backgrounds. I'm going to label these approaches contextualism and philosophical engagement, respectively. They can be distinguished particularly well with respect to the study of Indian Buddhism, where they have coexisted for several decades. The situation is somewhat different for East Asian Buddhism, not my area of expertise, but it seems to me that philosophical engagement, at least of a certain kind, is less pronounced, even though there are signs that this is in the process of changing. So there are some question marks here. These two approaches, contextualism and philosophical engagement, did not come into being as clearly defined programs of research. A theoretical understanding of how they might differ did not precede the work that was informed by them. Rather, they reveal themselves as orientations within scholarly practice in the 20th and 21st centuries. I'm therefore going to discuss them now in greater detail by pointing to examples for recent work. I will also sketch some variations within each of these two approaches in the process and then turn to make an argument in favor of a context sensitive form of philosophical engagement. Again, by use and using a recent example from my own work, a collaboration with a philosopher. So let's take a closer look at what I'm calling contextualism. Contextualism, broadly speaking, aims to understand Buddhist philosophy in its own context. And it is informed by the understanding of Buddhist philosophy that I initially outlined. One that is malleable and tailored to the historical situation. One, does not, one that does not impose a narrow and technical 21st century definition of philosophy on a, historic, on a historical environment where thinking was informed by broader conceptions. Contextualism is in fact better viewed as a family of approaches rather than a single one. 
For depending on the focus of inquiry, scholars may draw on different kinds of context, textual, historical, social, intellectual, and or religious context, usually in some combination with different emphasis depending on the chosen research questions. Contextualism includes, but is not limited to classical historical philological scholarship. As far as emphasis is concerned, we can currently distinguish two main approaches within contextualism. The first focuses on intellectual, including philosophical context, pursuing questions such as the following. What audience was a particular text aimed at? What kind of knowledge was available to philosophers at the time when they wrote their works and enabled them to make the claims that they made? Which opponents did a philosopher mean to refute? Why did a philosopher approach a topic differently to earlier thinkers? What kind of problem situation motivated the formation of certain philosophical ideas? Here, scholars trace historical debates or aim to make a philosophical position or argument intelligible by drawing on context. When it comes to Indian Buddhism, studies on such questions are frequently linked with philological groundwork. That is, with the production of first-time scholarly editions and modern translations of particular texts or parts thereof, with an analysis of the transmission history of the edited texts and with analysis of language and terminology. This reflects the overall situation in this particular field. Many significant texts remain unedited and exist only in manuscript form, chiefly in Sanskrit, while others remain accessible only in historical translations into Chinese or Tibetan. Still others are available in pioneering Pandit editions from the late 19th and early 20th centuries that were produced at the remarkable speed which only trained Indian pundits could muster. But these were not based on the detailed investigation into language content and background that we expect today from a scholarly edition of a philosophical work, and pundit editions can and need to be revised, all the more if new manuscript material has become accessible. The same also appear, uh, applies to classical editions produced by pioneering um, Buddhological scholars, scholars like Louis de Lavalle Poussin, for instance. Philology, in other words, remains crucial for the study of Indian Buddhist philosophical literature, and this explains why we have this close link between philology and contextualist studies of Buddhist philosophy. Some examples for major recent studies pursuing intellectual context are Shinya Moriyama's study of omniscience in the late 8th century Buddhist epistemologist Pranayakara Gupta, Vasant Elchinger's and Isabel Radier's monograph on Dharmakirti's critique of the notions of self and person, or Patrick McAllister's more recent monograph on Ratnakirti's theory of concept formation, the Apoa theory. My own work in general also belongs to this genre and has more recently been connected, concerned with questions of idealism and the reality of the external world. Some authors who pursue intellectual context also draw on a background in Western philosophy in their readings of Indian texts. And among those I have just mentioned, and that you also see on the handout, Moriyama, McAllister and myself do so more frequently than Vassar Elchinger and Isabelle Ratier. Sarah McClintock's study on missions and the rhetoric of reason, published in 2010, can also be added here as an example for a study of intellectual context that is particularly concerned with methods and styles of reasoning and has, in comparison to the others, less of a philological component. A second kind of study, apart from those focusing on intellectual context, focuses rather on social context, or more precisely, socio-religious context. Here, scholars ask questions such as the following. What aspects of the social environment might have motivated a philosopher to advance the position that they advance? How did the overall socio-religious setting, including dynamics of royal patronage, as well as the relationship between monastic scholars and laypersons shape the history of philosophy. 
Joseph Walzer's monograph Nagarjuna in Context from 2005 is a case in point. Walzer aimed to shift focus here from Nagarjuna as a philosopher to viewing him as an early champion of the nascent Mahayana movement and connected his some of his philosophical arguments to addressing laypersons uh, who should support the nascent Mahayana movement to a greater extent. Vincent Elchinger's study, Buddhist Epistemology as Apologetics from 2014, aims to explain the rise of the so-called Pramana school in the sixth century as a response to increasing hostility towards Buddhism from Brahmanical circles. In an environment where competition in the realm of philosophy had real world implications in terms of competition over royal patronage. The Pramana school is a school that devotes its theoretical effort to epistemology and logic and traces itself back to Dignaga and Dharmakirti. Neither Elchinger nor Walser would reduce the history of philosophy to social and political factors. In fact, what they address is not so much development in the realm of specific philosophical ideas, but rather the emergence of particular movements or certain features of philosophical discourse in Elchinger's case. For instance, an increase in polemical exchange between Buddhists and Brahmanical authors. So this does not extend to content, to providing answers for why a philosopher, for instance, chose to advocate the claim that perception, sense perception is by necessity non-conceptual. This is not something that is possible to explain for social or political factors. At least no one has uh, dared advance such a claim so far. Throughout contextualist studies of Indian Buddhist philosophy, regardless of their emphasis, addressing basic historical questions remains a prominent concern. Questions such as where and when particular philosophers might have lived or how they fit into larger chronological frames. The physical and social context of classical Indian philosophy, generally speaking, is notoriously difficult to determine. External evidence that would allow us to place and date individual thinkers is often scarce. So we frequently have to rely on relative chronologies based on the analysis of theoretical development. And hypotheses in this realm have many moving parts and are subject to continuous revision. The recent controversy surrounding the dating of Dharmakirti illustrates this rather well. You see the literature referred to on the handout. Here, Helmut Grasser proposed a new date in the middle of the 60th, 6th century on which uh, Elchinger's book also relied, but this has been met, uh, has met with rather critical responses by Eli Franco and Florin Deleano. This is just to show that we also still have much historical work, basic historical work to do. What unites all these context-oriented studies is their historical orientation, their attempt to shed light on formation and change regarding particular problems and arguments, theories and ideas, or to illuminate particular historical forms of thought or intellectual practices. In case of Walser and Elchinger, again, the target of explanation is more broadly the rise and spread of particular philosophical movements, and there is less consideration of philosophical content. Now, I lump these studies together here under the label contextualism, which is admittedly a bit new and awkward, because they have in common that they ask questions of a historical nature and expect answers from a detailed and meticulous study of context. They do not rely on a uniform notion of context because different kinds of questions are being asked, but they have in common that they appeal to context as a causal factor that shapes and explains the historical course of philosophical thinking that accounts for the emergence of philosophical movements or gives rise to specific kinds of discourse. As a caveat, I should add that I am not using the term contextualism here to refer to a specific method for writing intellectual history. Contextualism in this sense 
is also identified with the method of G.G.A. Pocock from the Cambridge School of Intellectual History. But my use is broader as it is adjusted to the field of Buddhist studies and recent research tendencies. Contextualism has historically dominated the study of Indian Buddhist philosophy worldwide. It is prominently reflected in the historical philological scholarship that initially defined the academic disciplines of Indology and Buddhology in the mid to late 19th century. Most continental European as well as Japanese scholarship on Buddhist philosophy is today produced by scholars with this particular background and accordingly also has a contextualist orientation. In the past two decades, contextualism has been revitalized in the field of Indian Buddhism and I want to briefly highlight some reasons for this. Indology has generally undergone what we might call a manuscript turn or a return to the sources. Greater emphasis is now placed on studying Sanskrit texts in manuscript form, and more attention is paid to the history to, of texts and their material basis, much greater than was the case when I started studying, which was in the late 1980s. And this development took place in part because important new manuscript material has become accessible. As regards Indian Buddhist philosophy in particular, the most significant development in this regard has been the possibility to work, at least in limited ways, with Sanskrit manuscripts in photocopies that are kept in the Tibetan autonomous region. Since 2003, the collection of manuscript copies kept in the China Tibetology Research Center, the CTRC in Beijing, has been to some extent opened to international research within the framework of cooperation agreements between the CTRC and institutions in Austria, Germany, Italy, and Japan. Research on such manuscripts is also increasingly being pursued in China, where Sanskrit studies are flourishing or flourishing again at several universities. The CTRC collection is a window on the larger cultural archive of Sanskrit manuscripts in the Tibetan Autonomous Region. The originals are reportedly kept in monasteries and in some institutions in Lhasa, such as the Tibet Museum. Just to give an idea of the size of this cultural archive, we're talking about um, 60,000 folios, attesting to some 3,500 or 4,000 works. These are figures uh, from Chinese media. And they attest works from all fields of Indian Buddhist literature. The history, and in particular, the research history of this enormous cultural treasure has been documented elsewhere, notably by Ernst Steinkellner from Vienna, my mentor and teacher, who together with Lakpa Puntsov, the Tibetan former director of the CTRC, was instrumental in making recent research endeavors on these materials possible. Access to the CTSC collection is still problematic, and the original manuscripts are largely out of bounds even to scholars working within China. Still, the limited access that has been possible has already led to a particularly rich harvest for Buddhist philosophy, and I have listed the most important completed editions on the handout. Works of Dharmakirti are now available in their original language, Sanskrit, for the first time to modern studies. Formerly, studies had to rely on classical Tibetan translations, as well as textual fragments in Sanskrit scattered throughout commentaries and other literature. The CTSC collection also holds manuscripts of earlier figures from Abhidharma and Yogacara, such as Vasubandhu and Stiramati as well as other works by philosophers in the Dhammakitian tradition, such as Dhammottara, Pradnyakara Gupta, or Jitari. And last but not least, works of figures that are entirely unknown from the historical record. So far, where we, from the historical record, where we even have difficulties reconstructing their names. The rich treasure that these manuscripts constitute is far from being exhausted, and the hope is that international efforts to advance its study can continue in the future. The reason why I'm drawing attention to this particularly important body of sources is that its existence is a driving force in the study of Buddhist philosophy today. 
lending urgency to make use of these invaluable materials to expand our knowledge base and to also revise and reconsider what we believe we already know. Now let me turn to philosophical engagement as the second main approach and the one that has become more prominent more recently and gained ground, especially in the English speaking West. I borrow the term philosophical engagement from a 2013 article by John Tabor entitled On Engaging Philosophically with Indian Philosophical Texts. In this programmatic paper, Tabor argues that one should indeed engage with Indian philosophical literature also on philosophical terms and not only pursue historical philological scholarship as valuable and necessary as it may be. My following remarks are indebted to many of Tabor's arguments, although for reasons of time, I will not able to indicate this on every occasion and also not indicate where my assessment departs a little bit from his. Philosophical engagement is informed by the principle that one should take Indian Buddhist ideas, theories and arguments seriously as philosophy. Not just Buddhist ideas, but Indian ideas or Asian philosophical ideas in, generally, in general. These ideas, theories and arguments should not just be treated as historical artifacts from a distant past or as exotic products from a life world radically different from our own, which might imply that we do not stand to learn anything from it and that it may have little relevance today. We should accordingly not just want to know what Dagarjuna or Dhammakirti said, but we should also be interested in knowing whether what they said was true and whether the arguments that they used to support their claims stand up to criticism to criticism that was put forward against them historically by their opponents, but also to criticism that might be formulated, bearing in mind contemporary thinking on any given subject matter. Philosophical engagement hence pursues evaluative questions, and those who pursue it are usually trained philosophers. Here we can note a first point of difference to contextualist studies. Contextualists often display or express a certain reluctance to critically assess, posi assess positions and arguments. They do so for a variety of reasons. They may regard themselves as lacking the philosophical training that would be required to do so. So this may well be an expression of scholarly modesty and awareness of the limits of one's own backgrounds. Also, being aware of the limited and incomplete nature of our historical knowledge of individual thinkers and their works, contextualists may regard, simply, may regard it simply as premature to assess certain theories philosophically. They may consider it as necessary to first acquire a better knowledge about context. Before we can think about whether the theory is true, we have to see whether the text that it is based upon is reliably preserved. And lastly, contextualists may also think that since much of Indian Bud and Buddhist philosophy closely relates to the realm of religion, asking questions about truth would be misplaced. One can, of course, object here to this reluctance, which is sometimes expressed very vocally, that some kind of critical evaluation is a necessary part of any historical study of a knowledge system like philosophy that extends to beliefs and propositions. Such historical studies, after all, typically involve claims to the effect that there was a certain kind of development or progress. Dhammakiti solved certain problems in logic that Dignaga did not resolve or was not able to resolve. But as soon as you make such arguments, you do engage in some kind of critical evaluation. So the question is perhaps not whether one critically evaluates, but how, and more specifically, what standards and criteria are used in such an evaluation. I'm going to return to this point later, closer to the end of my talk. 
To return to my outline of philosophical engagement, in its critical dimension, it requires drawing a knowledge of a broader range of relevant theories, not just those from an Indian context, but also those from Western philosophy. This does not always mean that one explicitly compares a Buddhist philosopher's views on any given subject with those held by some European or Northern American thinker. Philosophical engagement, in other words, is not the same as comparative philosophy. Other approaches may also be pursued. Jay Garfield, for instance, described comparative philosophy as juxtaposing texts from different traditions to notice similarities and differences. And he contrasts this with his own approach of cross-cultural philosophy. Cross-cultural philosophy means, in his words, to make the resources of diverse traditions and their scholars available to one another and create new dialogues. Mark Sideritz also sees problems with comparative philosophy and its implication of a distanced point of view from which two philosophies could be objectively compared. He describes his own approach as one of fusion philosophy. Assuming there are distinct traditions of philosophizing, problems arising in the one can be solved through elements from the other. And in principle, the fusion can work both ways. One might solve Western philosophical problems through elements from Eastern traditions and vice versa. Sideritz is perhaps the one who most persistently and thoroughly worked on introducing Buddhist philosophy and Indian philosophy in general into the contemporary philosophical conversation and to use the resources that these traditions provide to address current philosophical problems. To use his 2003 monograph on personal identity as an example, here he developed a reductionist theory of personal identity that was in part inspired by discussions in Indian Buddhist texts. And he subsequently subjected this theory to criticism, an endeavor that has been praised for its philosophical sophistication. Sideritz's work on the whole has proved formative and influential. Many more recent attempts in analytic philosophy to draw on Indian and Buddhist theories can be taken as following his lead. Other scholars also aim at an ultimately philosophical and critical understanding, but in their studies draw on the intellectual environment of Indian Buddhism to a greater degree. Here, I think of the work of Tom Tillemans, Parimal Patil, Dan Arnold, or John Taper. Again, you see some publications listed on the handout. These scholars, broadly speaking, elucidate important historical debates between Buddhists and others, the Nyaya, by Sheshika or Mimasaka schools, with respect to their philosophical substance. They consider Buddhist positions within the broader context of the range of positions held in Indian philosophy, or they trace the historical trajectory of individual problems and their treatment. These scholars also use contemporary philosophical tools. Tillemans, I think, rightly insists that this does not necessarily amount to an appropriation of Buddhist philosophy to the present. The point is much rather to combine historical philological competence with philosophical sensitivity. Jan Westerhoff's recent history of Buddhist philosophy, the golden age of Indian Buddhist philosophy, also combines critical investigation with a historical approach. Contextualism and philosophical engagement, as I've outlined them here, pursue different questions, but there is also some overlap. Some, like Tillemans or Patil, who critically investigate Buddhist philosophy give greater consideration to historical or intellectual context. Some who study questions in the history of Buddhist philosophy, like Moriyama, McAllister or myself, also use Western philosophical ideas to bring out certain aspects of Indian philosophical thought more clearly. The overlap is particularly visible in a forum that has become a somewhat regular occurrence. Even though it was not initially planned that way, the International Dharmakirti Conferences 
the sixth of which is scheduled to take place in Korea later this month. Here, contextualists and philosophical engagement encountered each other on a more or less regular basis, and the exchange has on the whole been fruitful. There is cross-fertilization, and one can see this particularly well in these conference volumes that have been published since 1991 continually. As both approaches have expanded in the most recent past, it may, however, be useful to think more closely about their premises and procedures, their merits, as well as their limitations. I cannot do so here comprehensively, but will focus on particular aspects of the style of philosophical engagement that we find in the work of Mark Sideritz and also of others, and try to show the merits of a more context sensitive approach than his. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit now on the premises of one particular kind of philosophical engagement and point out its limitations and advocate for another. Sideritz's primary goal is to introduce theories and arguments from the Indian past into the ecosystem of contemporary Western philosophical discourse, in particular in the field of, in the tradition of analytic philosophy. In methodological terms, his studies involve a step that some designate as rational reconstruction or theoretical reconstruction. I will proceed to use the latter term. Theoretical reconstruction means to restate a historical philosopher's thesis in terms of contemporary philosophy. And oftentimes contemporary philosophy here equals analytic philosophy. Theoretical reconstruction also deliberately and purposefully detaches individual theories from the larger theoretical edifices of which they historically formed a part. And it also detaches such theories from certain kinds of beliefs that past philosophers may have held. Beliefs that we today no longer consider defensible or worthwhile sharing. Philosophers like Vasubandhu, who lived in the fourth, maybe early fifth century common era on whose work Sideritz relies, subscribed to a large variety of beliefs that philosophers today simply do not share. Karma, rebirth, nirvana, or to some extent, a mind-body dualism. And these beliefs are methodologically simply set aside for the purpose of philosophical critique when you perform this method of theoretical reconstruction. Now, theoretical reconstruction has its merits and its values, and it is legitimate. It may be selective by detaching beliefs from larger contexts, but it is not necessarily arbitrary. It can proceed in a regulated and methodically guided fashion that leads to relevant and well-supported conclusions, provided that it restricts, restricts itself to following up on the logical implications that a historical statement carries, and that it supports its results with reasoning. And to know such logical implications is valuable in dealing with past philosophers, it may be very useful for contextualists who are making their way through difficult oeuvre of past thinkers and who may then detect that one, one argument's logical implications are dealt with in a different text than they expected. This is just one example how this can be of value. Historical context for its part is not entirely absent in studies like those by Sideritz. It may be drawn upon to set the stage for the actual philosophical investigation. Biographical motivations on the part of Buddhist philosophers may also be outlined in order to give a fuller picture. But such aspects are usually kept separate from the step of theoretical reconstruction. They are considered to indicate factual conditions for the articulation of philosophical ideas in other words, context and content are neatly separated. This rests on a particular way of viewing philosophical truth and validity in its relationship to context. In this view, propositions that are advanced in texts are concerned with stable aspects of the world, of language, or of thought. 
The truth of such propositions is independent of when or where they were formulated. The validity of any given philosophical principle is independent of its genesis. This can be particularly nicely summarized in German, genesis is not the same as Geltung, genesis is not validity. As John Tabor points out, philosophers regularly proceed in the same fashion and on the basis of the principles that I have just outlined with respect to ideas from the European tradition. They borrow insights from Aristotle or use arguments from Descartes in addressing philosophical problems today. It would be exaggerated were we to dismiss the methodical device of theoretical reconstruction that is involved in such borrowing as entirely illegitimate. Moreover, if we admit that past thinking can be turned into a resource for present day philosophy, why should we limit ourselves to ancient Greek or early modern French thinkers? Would the potential benefit not even be greater if philosophy also availed itself of Nagarjuna or Dharmakirti and extended its horizon to something new beyond what has already been chewed over so many times? Yet, Theoretical reconstruction and the strict separation of content and context that comes with it should not be relied upon as exclusive devices for accomplishing this extension of horizon. This is the point that I want to argue. Theoretical reconstruction involves extracting ideas that appear useful to a philosopher here and now from complex systems of the past and discarding what to us appear to be useless beliefs. But by doing so, we may miss valuable aspects of the systems we are borrowing from, besides those that are immediately relevant to the problem we might be interested in at the moment. Tabor pointed this out in a response to Sigrid's 2003 monograph. Let me expand Tabor's considerations by presenting an example, by presenting an example for a form of philosophical engagement that is more sensitive to historical and religious context in order to demonstrate an alternative approach. In 2014, Tabor and I published a lengthy article in which we proposed a new interpretation of Azubandu's Vimshika Vidyapti Matrata Siddhi, the demonstration of mere cognition or mind only in 20 stanzas. The Vimshika is the earliest Indian Buddhist philosophical work that develops a proof of the signature Yogacara idea that the threefold world is merely cognition. I mean a philosophical proof. There are doctrinal proofs in earlier, world, in earlier works. This idea that the world is merely cognition entails that there are no external objects. Scholars have asked, what might be the closest analog to the idea of mere cognition in Western philosophy, not just with respect to the Vimshika, but also with respect to other Yogacara works and thinkers. Many have understood the Vimshika or the idea of mere cognition as being close to subjective idealism, idealism as it was advanced by Bishop Berkeley. The view that object, objects cannot exist without being cognized or that in other words, there is no mind independent world. Some have however denied that mere cognition amounts to idealism. They have done so in different ways, which converge on the point that Vasubandhu does not entirely deny the reality of the external world, but makes a more limited argument. For instance, according to Hall or Hayes, he argues that all features of human experience can be fully explained through features of the mind. Or, according to Klaus Oetke, he denies only that the objects we experience are external, and not that external objects exist. These non-idealist interpretations of Azubandu draw attention to a rather puzzling feature of the proof in the Vimshika. It does seem to stop short of a full-throated denial of the external world. Tabor and I therefore looked, uh, thought to look at the Vimshika again 
Our aim was not necessarily to introduce Vasubandhu's proof into any contemporary philosophical conversation. Idealism is not really a position that philosophers today feel worthwhile upholding or defending. Still, our goal was to philosophically engage with the Vimshika. Tabor had the idea to approach it in terms of a possibly negative proof strategy. If Vasubandhu were to deny the external world, he would have to adopt a proof strategy that establishes the non-existence of something. Does he have such strategies in other contexts? Yes, he does, we thought. In the ninth chapter of the Abhidharma Kosha Bhashya, he refutes the existence of a self or a person, an Atman or Putgala. So what we did here was to look at relevant parts of the oeuvre of the same author. We took textual context into consideration. Tabor then had the idea that a certain proof strategy was at work in the Abhidharma Kosha Bhashya, chapter nine, and we then looked whether the Vimshika might exhibit the same strategy, and after a lot of back and forth, we agreed that this was the case. Our argument was that both works proceeded by using a specific argument pattern that in Western philosophy is known as an argument from ignorance. Basically, absence of evidence is evidence of absence. Now, that's a problematic thing. Yeah, it's a really problematic argument. Uh, but it gets better. Vasubandhu goes through each of a list of accredited sources of knowledge of pramanas and asks whether it provides evidence for the self or for external objects by apprehending it. These sources are sense perception, inference, and scripture. And Vasubandhu then determines with specific arguments that the disputed entity, self or the external world, is actually not apprehended by either of these three pramanas, which strongly suggests that it is non-existence. Arguments from ignorance are used in Indian philosophy around Vasubandhu's time. They're often associated with the term non-apprehension or anupalabdhi. After Vasubandhu, Dharmakirti will discuss their problems and limitations and severely restrict their applicability. But this kind of problem awareness cannot yet be assumed for as a bundle. Arguments from ignorance are certainly not deductive, and in textbooks or modern logic, they are often treated as fallacies. However, in certain forms, such arguments can be pretty strong abductive arguments. So this belongs rather to the realm of informal logic, not formal logic. They do not logically force the conclusion, but very strongly support it. And scientists, as well as philosophers, use them with certain restrictions today. So what we did here was to look at the broader context of Indian philosophy and at specific strategies of argumentation that historically developed within it. We positioned Vasubandhu in relationship to this historical field. We anticipated the objection that we violated the principle of charity, according to which one should always attribute the best possible argument to a philosopher or generally one's discussion partner. The argument from ignorance may not be the best possible argument for idealism, but by pointing out conditions under which it is a sound abductive argument, we offered philosophical reasons to support our interpretation. And of course, we offered many textual arguments to support it. In arguing for our interpretation, we went through the entire text. Many earlier interpretations focused on the beginning portion of the Vimshika and on just one particular section, verses 11 to 15, where you find a really famous and influential argument centering on the logical impossibility of an atomic constitution of the material world. This is a passage that is obviously philosophical in nature. When a present-day philosoph philosopher reads it, they become interested. Other passages appeal to traditional Buddhist lore and are usually set aside in philosophical readings of the Vimshika, but we thought, you know, why not take a look at them? At one point, for instance, Vasubandhu enters a discussion about the reality of the guardians in the Buddhist hells. <laughs> 
Vasubandhu here concludes that there is no reason to assume that the hell guardians arise as material elements produced by the karma of the hell denizens. This was a position held by the Sarvastivada school. And Vasubandhu argues that one can equally well assume that it is the cognition of hell denizens which merely transforms under the influence of their past deeds and shows the guardians as mental images. This would be a typical Yogacara uh, interpretation to reduce something that appears to be an external material object to a mental Im image in somebody's mind. Vasubandhu flatly denies the material existence of the hell guardians because there is no evidence for it. And this lends additional support to the idea that he equally flatly denies the material existence of objects of cognition in general, on the ground that there is no evidence for them. Hence, the seemingly arcane discussion is relevant to Vasubandhu's philosophical point. If we had simply dismissed this and similar discussions in our analysis, because they rest on outdated beliefs that we are not inclined to share, we would also have deprived ourselves of avenues for understanding Vasubandhu's philosophical position. What such examples show is that in reading Buddhist philosophical texts, it pays off also philosophically to pay attention to all their contents, instead of cherry picking just those that to our eyes might be most obviously philosophical. Finally, we also considered why Vasubandhu might have felt reluctant to provide a more explicit and straightforward positive proof of mere cognition, and instead opted to go all the way for a negative proof of the non-existence of external objects. He may have simply adopted a proof strategy with which he was familiar. The argument from ignorance was around. But there is an additional consideration. In the final verses of the Vimshika, Vasubandhu hints that the true nature of the mind, its suchness, or tatata, is only accessible to Buddhas. It is not an object of reasoning, of tarka. If one is aware that one's object of proof, mere cognition in this case, has aspects that are inaccessible to argument, one may be inclined to prove it indirectly and hesitate to formulate a direct and positive proof. By considering these final verses, we took Vasubandhu's commitments as a Buddhist philosopher seriously, rather than inadvertently treating him as an analytic philosopher who just happened to be born at the wrong time and has to pay lip service to tradition. I've presented this example to show how one can proceed to develop a philosophical understanding of a text that critically engages with it as philosophy, that takes it seriously, that attends to the quality of arguments, but at the same time remains sensitive to context, textual, intellectual, historical, as well as religious context, and does so in ways where history and context is not fully separated from content. Yeah? And this is where what we did clearly departs from Siddharth's approach. In more general terms, a context-sensitive philosophical engagement will incorporate important elements of what Gary Hatfield labeled a historically-oriented philosophical methodology. Hatfield is a historian of modern European philosophy who worked on Descartes and Kant. This methodology takes past texts seriously on their own terms seeking to understand the problems and projects of past philosophy as they were, instead of seeking a reading that solves current philosophical problem. This need not be uncritical or non-evaluative, but evaluation and criticism will in the first instance be, and this is the important point, rendered according to standards implicit or explicit at the time was work written. Um, and Hatfield goes on to stress that Determining such standards is also important philosophical work. It involves philosophical skills, and there may also be philosophical payoff, precisely because one takes past philosophies uh, uh, seriously on their own terms. Such standards that were implicit or explicit at the time the work was written 
for instance, in our case of the study of Vasubandhu, would be conceptions of the argument from ignorance. Using such historical standards, however, does not entail necessarily a strong position of historicism, where a past philosophical work only serves as evidence for past thought and has no other significance. Past standards of evaluation are not by definition foreign to current ones. The very fact, for instance, that we can recognize Indian arguments from non-apprehension or anubalapti as arguments from ignorance illustrates this very well. So we need to carefully reflect, in other words, on the relationship between past and present standards and be wary of premature identifications. An approach to Buddhist philosophy along the lines of Hatfield's historically oriented philosophical methodology overlaps to a considerable degree with a certain kind of contextualism. A contextualism that recognizes the need to include an evaluative dimension in its context-oriented study of Buddhist philosophy. I have earlier pointed out that contextualists are often adverse to critically assess positions and arguments. But as a matter of fact, they do often engage in evaluation of a historical nature, advancing, for instance, claims that progress was made in the solution of a particular philosophical problem. It's hard to see how this would not involve some kind of critical assessment. Evaluative questions, such as whether particular texts or theories or arguments are coherent, are necessary to some degree even when producing critical editions of philosophical, philosophical texts. The issue is once more one of the standards that are being employed. As contextualists will readily agree that standards of the time certainly are relevant in reading philosophical texts of the past, they will actually have much common ground with philosophical engagement that privileges precisely such standards. Now I come to my conclusions. I've sketched in summary two different approaches to the study of Buddhist philosophy and developed them at some length uh, by drawing on disciplinary background as well as recent work that was published and informed by them. Contextualist studies approach Buddhist philosophy in its own context. They vary depending on the emphasis of type of context, which in turn varies according to the research questions that are being asked. Such studies are more firmly anchored within area studies frameworks, and they are much more strongly embedded and also accepted in the field of Buddhist studies at large. These studies often have philological components and play an important role in expanding our knowledge base in a field where so many textual sources still remain unexplored and even unedited. They have recently been revitalized through better access to significant new bodies of sources, such as the Sanskrit manuscripts from the Tibetan Autonomous Region, that prove invaluable for our knowledge of Indian Buddhist philosophy. Philosophical engagement with Buddhist thought has also gained ground in recent times, fostered by general initiatives to make the philosophy curriculum in the West more inclusive and more credibly global. I've argued that there are different ways to critically engage with Buddhist thought. Philosophical engagement in the style of Mark Sideritz draws on Buddhist thought as a resource for addressing contemporary problems and crucially relies on the method of theoretical reconstruction, a method that restates past philosophical claims in modern idiom and detaches them from a theoretical edifice of which they formed a part, as well as from beliefs by Buddhist thinkers that we no longer share. This approach has undeniable merits, but it also has limitations. And as I've tried to argue, it should not be relied upon as an exclusive device for globalizing philosophy by broadening its horizon. I've drawn on the example of John Tabers and my own study of Vasubandhu's Vimshika, but I could also have drawn on other recent studies in order to carve out the contours of a more context sensitive approach within the larger frame of philosophical engagement. And the point that I was trying to make was that by considering intellectual as well as religious or soteriological context, even so-called outdated beliefs 
one also gains a better philosophical understanding of Buddhist philosophical literature. Lastly, I've pointed to the need to pay more critical attention to the kind of standards that are employed when one philosophically engages with Buddhist philosophy. I suggested that it's necessary to give greater weight to standards of the time and to reflect on how these relate to contemporary ones. If philosophical engagement proceeds in such a context-sensitive manner, it will have more overlap with contextualism and thus retain strong links with ongoing research that broadens our knowledge base and that to some extent it needs. These are uh, communicating vessels. Context-sensitive philosophical engagement is in a far better position to discover something new, to detect unexplored arguments or ideas that were so far simply not considered in Western philosophy, rather than pressing Buddhist ideas into the mold of views that are already known, which is a danger that I actually see in the method of theoretical reconstruction. So context-sensitive philosophical engagement can contribute to an understanding of Buddhist philosophy that takes the remarkable achievements of Buddhist thinkers seriously as philosophy, but also allows us to understand them in their own environment. And with this, I come to a close, and I'm looking forward to the, your questions and your comments. Thank you.